identified by this class. And I can't wait to hear um, any questions. I know today we may be joined by some people from Trinity Upperville, uh, Trinity Episcopal Church in Upperville, Virginia, that have been sort of following along with this class. And if you're here, welcome to you and anyone who's watching on YouTube as well. Um, so before we get going, we're going to, uh, well, we'll just begin um, with uh, Paul Zock has got another wonderful song for us. Paul, now have you, have you written this yourself? Yeah, I wrote this one a couple weeks ago with a friend of mine from Texas over, over Zoom. Wow. Uh, this is a psalm setting. I don't know if anyone realizes that almost all of the songs he's been performing for us, he's written specifically for this class, which is a real treat for us. Okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to mute mine, Paul, over to you. Right. This one kind of has an Advent type um, melody, so that's why I picked it for this week. Mm -hmm. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. And ever. A thousand generations are as nothing in his sight. And the ages pass like watches in the swift and silent night. Though we should be as nothing in the journey of his day. He makes us new each morning and he gives us grace to say. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever and ever. What are we that he loves us so and gave his only son, his creation and his promise that can never be undone. While day to day unfolds his name and night to night proclaims, Tell the wonders of the souls his endless mercy claims his love endures forever his love endures forever his love endures forever and From age to age you are And you clearly call us each by name Just like you name each shining star You fill us with your faithful love At dawn and we rejoice And lift the hands you made for us And raise our grateful voice His love endures forever His love endures forever his love endures forever and ever. Wow. Wow. Paul, thank you. Goodness. Thanks. That is fantastic. Okay, everyone, I'm going to share my screen. So that we can see, boopadoo. Um. How's that look? Everyone can see that. Yep. Yes. Great. All right. Well, again, those who just jumped on, thank you for being here. Thanks for following along this class. Um, all of these are archived on YouTube. If you want to go back, if you missed one, or if you want to just. Um, uh, find out what uh, what uh, uh, just refresh yourselves on um, what we've talked about because we have covered quite a lot of ground. Now this this week is our last class, and that doesn't mean we're going to stop talking about the Holy Spirit. In fact, as we learned anything 
It's that we were, when we talk about God's activity in the world, we are talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, but any questions that you have that aren't answered today or just topics you want to discuss, uh, you're welcome to reach me via email or, um, of course, just in person if, you, if we ever gather again <laughs> together in person. Oh, I shouldn't laugh. Um, but uh, this is... Uh, this is a, sometimes I think talking about the Holy Spirit and the reality of the Holy Spirit unearths things for people that maybe they um, think about um, it comes to them much later. So um, you're welcome to put your questions in the comments section right now, and I'll try to get to those. And those of the ones that I don't know the answer to, of course, I will, I will quiz my younger brother as soon as I can get a hold of him. Um, but I do hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, today on sort of building on Thanksgiving and today being the first Sunday of Advent, it feels somewhat appropriate that we're closing out by talking about spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts, and then denominations a little bit and some final thoughts from me as well. We will have a painting for you as well, but spiritual gifts. Last week we talked about, or the last class, we talked about fruits of the spirit which are the fruits of a changed heart. Remember, we talk about the Holy Spirit being the agent that replaces the heart of stone with the heart of flesh by which one's desires are shifted. And again, we, we, the, this, one of the refrains that I've been trying to hammer home is that um, odds are if you're focusing too much on following the rules and getting things right, well, then you're, 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 you might not be, that might be a sign that you're not following the spirit that in fact the 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 the, the fruit of a, of a of the holy spirit in your life of changing your heart will be changed desires out of which will grow naturally the fruits of the spirit now sometimes the fruit of the spirit or the fruits of the spirit get mixed up with the gifts of the spirit and when we're talking about the fruit of the spirit you're talking about relatively non-controversial things like patience and love and kindness gentleness um, when you're talking about the gifts of the spirit although these are undeniably good things that you are in the realm of major church controversy. And so I'm gonna outline a little bit of what that controversy is about today. But before we do it, what the great passage about spiritual gifts comes. Um, in fact, the last two chapters, uh, the chapters 12, 13, and 14 of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is um, uh, where we have the great uh, verses about the spiritual gifts. Now, just before we read this, and I do want to, going to ask one of you to read it. Remember, the Corinthians were a church, uh, a very, it was a very cosmopolitan church, but a very, very mixed up place where um, a full of anxiety and conflict and where these, this, this, this community that had, that had exploded was really kind of at war with itself and with all sorts of um, justifying all sorts of uh, sin in the name of God and the name of the spirit. And so Paul was at great lengths. One of the reasons this is such a long letter is because they had so many problems. Um, but here uh, we get to him talking about the gifts of the spirit and it's all in context of him trying to hammer home unity unity in the church and uh this uh, i'll tell you what 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 follows right on from this but he is this is this is at the at the end of a section where he's talking about how to um how the community should function and how it should come together and and that kind of orders was one way to put it but simply cohesion and so um as almost everything that the Corinthians did, there was a tendency among them to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit to create a new hierarchy and basically uh, a new almost justification, a new law among themselves and to, to exclude certain people. Uh, and so what he's trying to do here is to get to bring people together. Now, that said, who would like to read this passage? Libby, can you do it? Got to unmute yourself. I didn't catch to whom you were speaking. Oh, um, well, why don't you go for it, Charlie? Okay. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, 
but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the discernment of spirits, to another, various kind of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by the one and the same spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. <clears throat> Thank you, Charlie. Now, this is an enumeration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as uh, you know, Episcopalians, it should make you a little nervous because it's not something we talk about very often. And yet almost everything he mentions here is uh, beautiful. Uh, he says that to one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom, which is sort of just exactly what it sounds like. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. You know, as we, there is always in the Bible, a distinction between knowledge and wisdom that uh, knowledge is sort of information and wisdom is sort of the, the um, um, knowing what knowledge to use or knowing how to deploy that same knowledge. But then it gets into more, um, more sort of supernatural or what we would consider more spiritual giftings, which is uh, the uh, faith by the same spirit. Now, this is not saving faith. It's not meant as saving faith. It's meant sort of areas in which someone in the congregation can has a has been given faith to see uh, some kind of uh, solution or some kind of uh, uh, they're, they're, they're able to exercise faith in a way that is sort of practical. Then there's the gift of healing. Now that's meant as physical healing. This is referring to what the disciples were known for doing and the apostles uh, healing people. Another, the working of miracles. The miracle in this case is not necessarily the um, you know, a parting of the Red Sea or turning water into the wine. It's simply a miracle is anything that cannot be explained by natural means. Um, to another prophecy, prophecy is often ridiculed as a form of prediction or Copernicus style fortune cookie type thing. And there can be something of that, but really prophecy is simply meant that someone who has been given some glimpse into the mind of God some kind of, and sometimes that can be an ability to see things as they are. And that's usually, that's how it's used more and more. And especially in mainline denominations, if someone has a prophetic voice, it's not that they're saying such and such is going to happen. It's that they're saying such and such is happening and we're all ignoring it. Um, it doesn't, um, in this case, it's not confined to uh, just society or the future or the past. It's sort of all of the above. Um, then you have uh, the discernment of spirits, which is the uh, sense that there are false spirits out there that um, you do sort of, this is part of, the, part of, you could sort of say it's a subheading of wisdom, but to be able to discern what's of God, what's not. Remember, we've been, one of the main uh, difficulties in talking about the Holy Spirit is this issue of discernment. And in fact, it says here that that, that Ability to discern is itself a gift of the Holy Spirit. Then enough, another various kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues. This is where things get a little sticky. When the original Pentecost uh, that we read about in Acts, they talk about people being able to speak languages, earthly languages that they hadn't been able to speak before that moment. In, in this is usually interpreted as both heavenly and earthly tongues. And this is where, when we're talking about Pentecostals and the speaking in tongues, you have people, um, oftentimes those tongues are not someone breaking out in Swahili uh, or Arabic. It's someone speaking in sort of a, what they would consider to be a heavenly tongue, a tongue that doesn't really even exist. Um, but then there's the another the interpretation of tongues. But again, all throughout this is the emphasis of Paul is on the fact that it's coming from the same place, that these are not uh, modes of differentiation. The implication among the Corinthians would be that they had used these gifts to create a new hierarchy 
of these were better gifts than those gifts, that the, the people who had the gift of prophecy were superior to those who had the gift of administration. You know, the, the, there's always a sense of which we were, they, people took these gifts and immediately, instead of uh, utilizing them for the good of the world and the good of the church, we utilize them for self-glorification. And that is what he's, he's pushing back against, that, that this is all supposed to be of the same spirit. Now, before we stop for questions, I want to say a couple of things, because this is uh, important for us to recognize as people reading this uh, 2,000 years later. Paul would have assumed, and he did assume, that people who had received the spirit, which is anyone who had been baptized, that that led into some sort of gifting that that is what defined them as Christians as a, to a certain degree. Though the focus is, again, always on the value of the gifts for the con this congregation, for the support and encouragement of the church, not for the, 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 their own sake. But then there's also a recognition that different people are given different um, gifts, that there's something democratic, you might even say, <clears throat> excuse me, about the way that these gifts are distributed, um, especially in light of the fact that some seem to be glamorous and exciting, and some, uh, you know, who wants to who wants to have the uh, you know um, the the what is the one here? Um, the discernment of spirits is not quite as exciting as healing you know people who are sick, at least in in my mind. Um, and yes, there is uh, people who are gifted at administration because this, this chapter, this passage immediately follows on from it, talking about one body with different body parts, all of the different members working together to, in order to, to for the body, it's, it's a, it's, it, when we talk about the body of Christ, um, this, it's immediately following on the gifting of the spirit. And so that sense in which all the whole body cannot work without its various members is meant yet again to um, undermine any uh, instinct we would have to take these gifts and uh, just co-opt them for our own self-justification and our own glory. Um, so he did not think that it was... Um, uh, strange that God's this presence of God's spirit would be accompanied by miracles and miraculous gifts of power. In fact, Paul saw it time and time again. This is the man who lived through most of the book of Acts. It was not strange. It was, it was exactly what was, what was going on in, in the establishment of the church that he was helping establish. But a, another, a common and helpful interpretation of the Corinthian problem is that they had engaged in a form of enthusiasm you know, an, an emotional uh, inflation. That's remember we talked about enthusiasm in the in enthusiasts in an earlier class that um, that led to what we would call an over-realized eschatology. Eschatology is a fancy word for the end of the world. See, these people thought the letters that Paul was writing. They thought that they were living um, that that the second coming, which we are awaiting at Advent still today. And I talked about in today's sermon, the second coming was, was right upon them. There would be no such thing as children who were born as Christians. It was simply God was coming again fast. And so they believed that in had been given these gifts, that they had already been made how they would be at the eschaton, at the end of time. You know, we talk about the transforming of the world in the twinkling of an eye when, when Christ comes again, that this is an immediate and sort of uh, apocalyptic uh, event, but these Corinthians had mistaken the fact that they'd kind of, that they've been made, to use modern parlance, they've been kind of made superheroes, and there was nothing else that they needed, that God had somehow emancipated them from any dependence on God through the giftings of the Spirit. So Paul is very, uh, he, he wants to, um, he's pushing back against the sense that they're, they're, sanctified or fully realized as new creations, that there's nothing they will need at the end of time, at the second coming. And so um, for the Corinthians, their giftings had, had brought to an over-realized eschatology. Um, and uh, so, but it, it bears saying that almost all scholars agree that the early Christian church, the Christian church of the first century was considerably more charismatic meaning more focused on the gifts of the Holy Spirit than we are in 21st century America, certainly in mainline Western, you know, Anglicanism, Episcopal uh, world, that they, they would have been much more, they would, it would have felt more Pentecostal, actually, um, 
Does that mean, therefore, that we should all become more Pentecostal? We should all be speaking in tongues? And I don't think so, actually. And we're going to get to how church theologians have sort of interpreted the gifts of the Holy Spirit as time has gone on. Um, but it's important to just say that there is the role of eschatology in Paul's uh, description of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that, um, that there's a difference between how Paul would have seen the giftings of the Holy Spirit and how uh, we do. They thought that the end of days was at hand and that this was the final generation or two before, before Jesus's return. And nearly 2,000 years later, of course, we are, we, here we still are. Pentecostal revivals often recover this idea, and they are often disappointed. Still, it is interesting to note that there's far more of this sort of charismatic uh, emphasis than there has been in any period since the early church. This sort of stuff went pretty dormant for a long time. Um, but uh, the one thing, the, the last thing I want to say before we look at the, to this week's painting, or we break for questions, is that the dramatic gifts of the Spirit here, again, are meant for the sake of the church, for the sake of evangelism. It isn't for individual edification. And in fact, as we read in 1 Peter, uh, Peter writes, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So you might even say that if you're looking to discern the spirit and that gift of whatever it is you feel you've been given by the Holy Spirit is being used primarily for your own benefit, well, then it might not be the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we're talking about here, that these gifts are meant for, for the sake of others. Now, one other thing to note here is that... Um, does anyone know, this is, uh, we've just read the great passage was from 1 Corinthians 12 on spiritual giftings. What comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Does anyone know off the top of their head? Because you're all familiar with it. Starts with tongues. It starts with tongues. It's about love. It's about love. It's the great wedding passage, the passage that everyone reads at every single wedding, which is his, again, which has to do with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily with Hallmark cards and white dresses. And that passage is, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. You know the rest. This is one of the great, most beautiful and inspiring passages in the entire New Testament. And it is Paul saying that the spiritual gifts are meant for the sake of love. That is the bottom line of discernment here love and uh that love never fails uh but where there are prophecies they will cease where there are tongues they will be stilled where there is knowledge it will pass away for now we know in part and we prophesy in part but when perfection comes the imperfect disappears um now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror through a glass darkly then we shall see face to face now i know in part then i shall fully know ev even as i am fully known this is, and the, the greatest, uh, uh, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, again, here we have Paul saying, in fact, he seems to be saying that some of these gifts are going to fade, but what will remain is love, faith, hope. And this is part of the crux of what people have thought about for so long that this, all of these chapters, these chapters which are read in these uh, services that are that kind of become a little anodyne over time, it's actually the, the heart of the enormous amounts of uh, recrimination and resentment among Christians and division, um, which is odd because it seems to be such an inspiring and beautiful and unifying passage. So let's stop there for a moment and take questions or comments. I'm trying to... to yeah, so this is uh, this is Harrison. Um, 
yeah, I, my roots are in a charismatic Pentecostal church. And the one that I went to, I thought, and still think was, was really balanced in terms of addressing spiritual gifts and, and the role of gifts in the life of the church. And, um, the, the church that I was involved in robustly pursued the spiritual gifts are described in first Corinthians 12, but there was a, a real, I felt a real clarity that I learned about how the gifts in and of themselves are not, are neither indicative of some special level of spirituality, nor were they valuable in and of themselves, but they were valuable to the degree to which they were producing the fruit of the spirit in the individual who got the gift, but also in the body, you know, sort of the Ephesians 4, um, what is that, how does that go? He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So again, in this church that I was in, they, they, they really were hard chargers after the spiritual gifts. <clears throat> They were very clear about the purpose and the function that just because somebody got one of the more spectacular or attractive gifts or controversial gifts, it didn't mean they had some special level of spiritual maturity. It was like it's pure gift designed to produce the virtues of God, the fruit of the spirit. And so anyway, it's helpful. That was a really Thank helpful you. foundation to me. Thank you, Harrison. Anyone else like to chime in? And I, I like to hitchhike on what Harrison said, and also what you said earlier, Paul, about the purpose of gifting us differently. You know, I like to say that God didn't make us to be independent people, and we all like to pride the fact that we have independence, independent thinking, etc. He gifted us differently so we could become interdependent. And in that Ephesians passage that um, uh, Harrison referred to, it says, from him, meaning the Holy Spirit, the body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So having different gifts helps us live in harmony, live in unity, which is how you began this session. And that's yes. how, I'm, how I view the uh, different gifts that we have. And, you know, it's wonderful, you know, to have the gift, but to recognize the gift in somebody else and encourage them mm. to use their gift for the good of the whole, not just themselves. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. That's beautiful. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen again. And we're going to look at this week's painting. Here we go. All right, this is the Pentecost by El Greco <clears throat> uh, from 1600, sort of on the nose. He, <laughs> he was working on it sort of towards the, this is the, kind of towards the end of his life. Now, El Greco is a very um, fascinating character. El Greco was a painter who lived in basically uh, the mid to late 1500s through, I think he died 1614. And he's called El Greco. That's not his actual name. His actual name is Dominikos Theotokopoulos. Pol Polus, I almost can't say it. It's such a Greek name. This is a man who was born on Crete, who then went to Venice, who went to uh, Rome, and then finally ended up in Toledo, Spain, which is where he got the name El Greco, which simply means the Greek. Uh, he began in Crete as an icon painter. He's a painter of icons. Uh, and so in a sense, because he went from Crete to this, from painting in, in sort of iconography to Venice, which was very Roman, you know, Western, as opposed to Eastern, he's, a, he's this odd ball who kind of falls right at the intersection of the East and the West, of Byzantium and the Roman uh, Catholicism, of sort of Greek Orthodoxy and uh, it's sort of the Catholic Church. He's also right on the heels of the Reformation. Uh, now, he was known as such a character, he's such an individual, that for a couple of things to mention about him before we look at the painting itself. For a long time, people thought, um, over the years, they thought he, was, he had some serious vision problem, or he had lost his mind because of the way he painted these figures, which is elongated. 
uh, which is, it, it looks like my screen or your screen depends, maybe your screen is, but it shouldn't look like this. It, it, it might look like your screen is scrunched up you know, somehow, sometimes it does that to images, but it's not. This is how he simply how he painted. He was such a um, he was so full of himself that he apparently uh, told uh, Pope Pius V that he that Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel ceiling was so bad that he needed to repaint the entire thing. He offered to repaint all of the Sistine Chapel uh, so that it could really be. Um, fully in line with not only truth but also beauty he had he was he was constantly he's like one of these almost like um he, he was constantly having beefs with other it, it, putting down other artists of his day so um so again well into the 19th century he was thought that he had lost his mind or that he was um had lost his vision uh because there was no other way to explain his bizarre uh elongated uh figures um, it, but in about 1860, he was rediscovered uh, by impressionists like Manet and Degas. If you look at this, you can see, and you, you know Degas at all, uh, you can see that influence right here. Picasso, Kandinsky loved El Greco. These are, you know, ex those are ex expressionist painters and cubist painters. Um, they considered him to be the most uh, influential of anyone, but he kind of became the patriarch of the avant-garde, even though he had, uh, you know, been, been doing his work way back when. Anyway, this is part of an altarpiece. It would have been on the right-hand side, I believe, of an altarpiece painted uh, for a, a church of at the Church of the Augustan College of Maria del Aragon, uh, Aragon, excuse me, in Madrid. It's now in the Prado, but this would have been, um, if we had walked up to this painting, uh, we would be gazing upward. It was very, again, this is, it's, 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 it's hyper elongated and it's not only elongated in style, but also in substance. You would have been standing sort of at the feet of these uh, men at the bottom. Um, it is one of his later works. If you look at early El Greco, you could see that it looks more similar to um, altarpiece paintings of the time. Uh, and you know, his style got him into a lot of trouble. He would, he would, he would, he constantly he fell out of favor with the king of Spain, and essentially lost his livelihood about around this time. Um, but one of the things to mention, he was a painter of what would be called the Counter Reformation, which was the Jesuit. Uh, you know, uh, initiative to counteract all of the, the Protestant doctrines that had been floating out there. And yet El Greco, who considered himself to be a staunch Catholic, he was influenced by uh, some of the things we were talking about, Jansenism that we were talking about a few classes ago. He was influenced by some of these Protestant doctrines. And he, would vi he violated in this piece the central, uh, un uh, you know, tenets of counter-reformation painting. Counter-reformation painting was supposed to be, the content was supposed to be much more important than the style. Now, of course, what we see in El Greco is a, a triumph of style, uh, it's, or it's a, it's a marriage of style and content, but it's not what you would have gotten if you were used, trying to do something that was purely instructive. Here, he is doing something else. So um, in what he's doing is very much, you can almost use the word expressionistic. Last week, we, last time we looked at that Russian painting, which was so psychological. Well, he was, this is an extremely emotional painting too. And that's what stands out. It's almost hard to overemphasize how different this would have been from anything else being painted at the time. Um, by the end of his painting years, 1600, I mean, it was, it was more personal, more disconcerting, kind of off-putting to those who'd been there. It was distanced from uh, the, the contemporary painting at the time. One person, one uh, commentator describes it as a convulsive movement of, uh, em of emotional and physical, that he was able to project an enormous amount of emotional intensity and inner feelings into the work. Now, I've got plenty more to say about this painting, and I've provided a close-up here, but I'd love to hear what you have to say. What do you notice, given all that we've talked about? Hey, Dave, this is Bill. Can you identify the figures? I count uh, 16 figures, all of which have tongues of flame, but 10 of them are arrayed across the top. And the central yep. figure is, has the hands in a prayer motion. That, that makes that, a few different that's, Ma that's Mary. Next on Mary's left shoulder would be Mary Magdalene. 
um, and these are the rest of these are the just the, the apostles um, minus Judas. And uh, I think Martha is over there. She's there's another there's another female face. Now there's one very odd looking face. There's only one person looking at the camera, as it were. Yeah. And you know who that is? That's El Greco himself. He decided to paint himself in there as one of the apostles, but giving this very strange look. It, it, the kind of you feel like you're being um, glared at, or um, it's cutting through the the painting in a way that he both wanted to place himself in the event because he was a strong believer that this applied to him, but he was um, there's something eerie about this uh, his. Uh, visage here and it's um it's almost like a stern like you better you better be looking at here at this um but it's also mixed with a i don't know what i'm doing here look and a um a uh i, I don't know i wish that, that an acknowledgement that he wasn't actually there like the other people were what else do people see The different expressions on the faces, like the guy, the guy right behind Mary Magdalene, I guess, with the green uh, thing on, he <laughs> looks a little shocked, a little maybe scared, or yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's emotional, and it's it's again not everyone is reacting the same way. It's rem it should be reminiscent of the very first painting we saw, which is on the cover of my brother's book in which the spirit is, is, is sowing a little bit of divine chaos. There's not a formula. Not everyone is responding in the same way. And in fact, um, some look like they're in ecstasy. You're right. Uh, he looks like he's, um, I think that's James, but he, he looks like he's worried. Uh, the, the guy on the, on the far right of where I'm looking, he's almost pensive. Then you have people with eyes closed. Um, and then, of course, if you look at the full uh, altarpiece, the, the people are falling backward, and it's being not slain in the spirit. Don't they call that being slain in the spirit? That's what they call it today. Yes, and that's that's uh, what you see. Do you, I mean, this does not look like a bunch of people who are posing for a, a, a portrait. <laughs> right. It's wild. How is the spirit itself portrayed here? I get the dove at the top and the tongues of fire. The dove at the top, tongues of fire, a sort of otherworldly light. Mm -hmm. The light is not naturalistic at all, almost. There's these big swaths of bright color and the, um, the reflection off the garments uh, looks like it's been heavily, um, it just wouldn't look like that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's otherworldly. Photoshopping. <laughs> so, so, and actually, it's hard to find. Uh, this is the one from this is the music, image from the Prado itself. So, this is how it's supposed to look. Dave, who is the one with his arm up on the left hand side of the picture? You know, that's just another one of the apostles. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't like find out exactly who's who. If you if you look at some of the famous Durer paintings, uh, they have ways of distinguishing the disciples. Sort of. Are, Green, yellow, uh, red. They they all had like they're like Teletubbies a little bit. They all had. I'm just kidding, but they they all had uh, little colors with which they were associated for good reason. Um, but that's not. Um, I don't. I don't know. Uh, gay. Okay. But there's something again. There's some. There's a collective experience happening that's also highly individual. It kind of to me, it looks like a dance party almost. Like like they have their hands up. You know, like. They're experiencing something communally and it makes me think of like dancing together or something. Mm. It's gotta be ready to speak out. Finishes. Hey, Dan. Yes, Randy. Who is that uh, whispering in El Greco's ear? Oh, you mean uh, the, I, I, the guy on the far, far right? Yeah. I don't think he's actually whispering, Randy. I think he's staring up at the at the. He's the one who's more serene, almost, as well as the older man, the the older man right next to Mary. Um, I. I again, I don't know. If they, they, we're we're not supposed to. I don't. I don't think it's as important to decipher the individual characters so much as to figure out 
that the, when the spirit comes, it is, un, remember we talked last week about how it can produce suffering. It can also produce awe. It can produce um, uh, cohesion and it can also lead people into the desert. It can bring them together and healing. There's, there's a uh, remarkable amount of activity and dynamism in this painting, which sort of is a forerunner of a, it, it's, it's odd in the, it's out of time. It's anachronistic in that sense. Um, I, his, uh, the composition to me, it, it reminds me of the Last Supper, you know, mm -hmm. when they're all lined up behind the table. Now, I don't know how they really sat at the Last Supper, <laughs> but, um, and then Mary in the middle, instead of Jesus in the middle, it just. That, yeah. It, it, that's always that old joke about, you know, the disciples went in and they said, give, give us a table for 24 people, please. They say, why? Because we all want to sit on the same side. <laughs> you get it um yes it's it does it does echo that you know and the, and the renaissance would have been before this but it's um uh, so he would have been familiar no doubt with da vinci's work um the i the main thing i want to say here though is that the holy spirit is um energizing and um disconcerting and uh, enlivening, and there is fire, there is light, there is dove, there is people being overwhelmed, and people going into sort of serenity. And Mary is, uh, you know, her, what's, how would you describe her posture in the middle of it all? Adore. Ecstatic. Ecstatic, adoring, grateful, um, she seems to recognize, there, if anyone seems to recognize what's really going on there, it's, it's, it, it's she. Uh, and yet, who knows what, what, this is the beginning of the entire, uh, the early church. So that's El Greco. He was not, um, again, he fell out of favor with those in the Counter-Reformation for painting things like this. He fell out of favor with basically everyone. He sounds like a real artist, to be honest with you. Um, so um, convulsive movement, emotional intensity, awe mixed with fear, mixed with excitement, mixed with uh, simply God's presence in the world in an unexpected and um, just sort of uh, overwhelming way, I think is, is what we, we get from this painting in 1600. Um, I have one, one question, if I might. Yes. Um, there are the white streaks right above each person would that yes. represent the holy spirit or what is that Do you yes know the that, meaning of that? those are the tongues of fire the tongues of flame that when you read in acts the passages that the tongues of flame appeared wow. above um above people again the holy spirit is linked to fire as well as water as well as light and there's always a very strong um correlation between forces remember we've talked about the holy spirit being a force as well as a person and fire being like the refining fire of the spirit being something which burns away mm -hmm. that which is not pleasing to it or that which is um, and which is very much in line with um, the way that the spirit is described working in uh, all sorts of trial uh, but here it was simply this people with it it's he's simply trying to depict the actual biblical account which talked about uh, the um, tongues of flame. Hey, Dave. Yes. Do we know, is, is, is Mary's centrality actually a mark of Catholicism? And what was the figure in the left-hand panel? Um, the, I think it was the Annunciation was the very first one. And then uh, was, was the far left-hand panel was the Annunciation. The middle one was, I think, the Crucifixion. And then you have the Pentecost afterwards. So, um, she was she's portrayed a lot of times centrally in, in in all of these i think it's it, yes it's it's due to catholicism but it's also just um uh, remember the very first one we looked at which was a french uh painting also had mary at the center and she is you know she's the mother of god so it's uh um i don't think it has any meaning beyond that she didn't have some special dispensation of the holy spirit mm. we only have 15 minutes left though and i've got some more material i want to get through everyone so if you'll bear with me Let's talk about what people believe is going on with the gifts of the spirit today. And uh, this is very interesting. I'm gonna, um, uh, this is the question of cessationism versus continuationism. Uh, cessationism is the doctrine that the gifts of the spirit ceased with the apostolic age, that they were intended 
simply to establish the church and to establish its credibility and uh, that then they ceased. And that's a, um, cessation, that's what cessationism is, is was generally a uh, innovation of um, the reformed and uh, John Calvin himself. But it was anytime you, if you were brought up in any kind of tradition that believed in different dispensations, that history was a series of different dispensations. That's how it was divided up. That there was a time when the spirit came to the world and then there was a, and, and now we're in a dispensation that's sort of where the end of times is coming. That is often uh, a sort of a Bible church and a Baptist upbringing. You'll, you'll hear about that. You won't hear about dispensations almost ever in an Episcopal setting, uh, but that's usually linked to cessationism. The gifts of the spirit ceased in a sort of a, in their formal way after uh, um, after the sort of apostolic age, after the church was established, that they were there in order to get the church going. But then you have continuationism, which is the belief that spiritual gifts have continued to the present age. Now, that is the actual position of the Roman Catholic Church. That is, in many ways, the position of the Anglican tradition, though the Anglican tradition is fudges it because there are plenty of Reformed Anglicans and plenty of more Anglo-Catholics, and they have very different views here. Now, um, if in a Roman Catholic expression, all of the gifts of the Spirit would take place exclusively within the church or almost, exclu almost exclusively within the church. But Methodists, for example, would be people who believed in continuationism. I, I spelled, I got an IS uh, spelling uh, wrong there. Uh, and then there's radical continuationism, which is the belief that all Christians have access to all the spiritual gifts right now. And in fact, that that's the norm, not the exception. That would be a more Pentecostal view. Now, it's uh, the reason cessationism, after we've heard all this wonderful stuff about the Holy Spirit, you're like, why would anyone be a cessationist? Well, um, the reason John Calvin uh, thought it was important to have make this demarcation is because people were using the gifts of the Spirit to create a hierarchy of believers and to create a second blessing in people's lives that it would took it detracted from God's grace. The Roman Catholics were, especially in the middle of the Reformation, they were using evidence of God's miracles and spiritual gifts as a refutation of by grace alone through faith alone. In other words, that we have um, special favor with God if we are exhibiting these uh, acts of this uh, acts of gifts of the spirit. And so that's what he was guarding. He was actually trying to guard against the devaluing of God's grace. That's really what was going on. And, and also respond to claims of Roman Catholic miracles, which were attempts to undermine uh, Protestantism. Now, um, the other thing that they were very worried about is that uh, an overemphasis on the gifts of the spirit would undermine the Bible. In other words, what would happen if you got a prophecy that somehow introduced new doctrinal information or changed doctrinal information or contradicted it? Now, this is a very real thing that we've been talking about throughout, and this is a, really a matter of discernment for those who do believe that the gifts of the Spirit are still active. Um, and you can see a lot of times when people, heretics over the centuries have used the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Spirit is doing something new or such and such, um, the continue, it's a little bit of a uh, uh, caricature of a continuationist understanding because a continuationist would usually say that any prophecy, any kind of new mind of God information, it, it would have to... It, um, um, be subordinate to scripture. It, if, if it contradicted Holy Scripture, then it, then it couldn't really be the same thing. So in, in one sense, they're both kind of, uh, you know, polarizing one another and slightly misrepresenting each other. But it, anyone who knows, um, who's familiar with Mormonism, for example, knows that in order to basically be seen as a uh, pious, you need to receive your own special revelation from God. And that has led to all sorts of the worst, most heinous abuses of uh, the Holy Spirit, or at least in, in name and function, by saying that, well, God has revealed to me that I need to have these many wives, or that God has revealed to me that I got to start a commune and take up guns against, you know, whomever. 
So it's a very, um, you understand where the secessionists are coming from, and but you also have to understand where continuationists are coming from. And they're coming from a clear, they're coming from a clear reading of scripture as well as an attempt to be faithful. Um, radical continuationism is sort of a, again, a reclaiming of that first century tradition, but in, a, in such a way that it sometimes feels like these are, uh, the gifting of the spirit is 100% necessary for the life of a believer and the norm rather than the exception. And in fact, that not only are people given specific gifts, but everyone is given every gift and you need to, it, it, it bleeds over into you now need to show that in order to be kind of considered uh, part of the church. What is the Anglican or Episcopal uh, position on this? Generally speaking, we fall along the lines of the Catholics and the Methodists. The Methodists were outgrowths of, uh, you know, uh, Anglicans in, in, uh, in this country, and uh, we're 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 open but cautious. Open but cautious, um, and that's that's basically where I sort of personally am. Not that, that matters, uh, but it's it's a it's a kind of I I think if you're if the Holy Spirit doctrine of the Holy Spirit doesn't if, if you've managed to completely contain it within a box that um, we, you know exactly where it's operating, where it's not, that seems to me that you have contradicted the sort of core teaching of scripture. And yet, if you've made it into a new justifying mechanism, well, then you've turned it into something that is clearly not either. Because remember, where the spirit is, there is freedom. This is, ties into one great final question as well, is, is the spirit everywhere? or nowhere, or just in the church. Um, and this is, uh, this is something that Christians fight about as well. Um, is, is the Holy Spirit at work in all acts of love, taking care of the sick, sick or is it only when Christians do these acts? Um, what about breakthroughs in people's lives that seem like miracles? I'm thinking of an alcoholic or a compulsive gamble or becoming sober, uh, the use of uh, the, uh, the 12 steps. Are these actual works of the Spirit? Or are they just analogies for the works of the Spirit? Um, this, these all raise very important questions for the work. If you are a continuationist in any kind of uh, respect, where, how far does the continuance go? Now, if you want to take the Bible seriously, you could say that the Spirit is at work in people preparing their hearts to become Christians. Like that's one of the main works of the Spirit. In that sense, the, the Spirit is clearly at work outside of the church bringing people in. Um, it, it's, I, I think, I mean, in my view, it, the Spirit is at work in all sorts of providential ways. And again, if we're totally fixated on figuring out when and where, then that might actually be evidence that the Spirit is not directing our thoughts. Um, and I also would say that, at least my brother would say that we should err on being more rather than less open to unexpected works of the Spirit because having a sort of a sense that the God's spirit works not just in the church, but outside the church means you can have real sympathy with those who cannot see God. Um, or you can say that God is everywhere. If you have eyes to see, you can pray for people to have their eyes opened. So um, there is a line between saying the spirit is in everything and, and nowhere. I mean, that's a, just, that's a fine line, but the idea that the spirit is only present in carefully delineated Christian context simply cannot be sustained, neither biblically nor theologically. The challenge related to the Holy Spirit, I know I'm saying a lot of things, but we have only five minutes and I want to wrap this up, is to simultaneously trust the Holy Spirit um, and to not be worried too much about our own correct discernment in any given instance. And secondly, though, to realize that the Holy Spirit is not the same as our spirit. And the Holy Spirit may well be present in and through difficulties, challenges, and sin, uh, not just as an agent of victory over them, meaning the thwarting of your ego, suffering. We've talked about this at length. Um, now, one, one final place I want to leave you here is the question has come up throughout the course of the difference in the way that the spirit is referred to in the Bible, uh, being filled with the spirit, receiving the spirit, being baptized in the spirit, being a temple of the Holy Spirit, being stirred or guided by the Holy Spirit. There's all sorts of ways that the Holy Spirit is um, referred to and all sorts of words that are used. The terms themselves are not actually that consistent in the Bible. 
instead of talking about the differences between these terms, it's more, I think, much more clarifying and helpful to talk about the difference in the per differences, different purposes of the Holy Spirit. And this is where I want to leave us, which is the different purposes of the Holy Spirit, um, which I'm just sort of reiterating in slightly different language as we did in the beginning, is firstly, applying Christ's reconciling work and sanctifying us. That receiving and filling with the Holy Spirit can mean that you're simply, the, the work of Christ's atoning work for you is being applied to you. And again, that sanctification can just be a realizing better of one's own sin, like a deeper realization of one's need, of one's interdependence and, and dependence on God. So that's, that's, that's the first one. Secondly, is the, the Holy Spirit uh, is there to empower witness evangelism, the increase of the good news. This includes both gifts, power, miracles, and creativity, uh, new beginnings. When people say that they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's usually what it means, is they're sent out to witness. Uh, but again, it can also mean that they've simply understood the first one. Uh, thirdly, uh, the Holy Spirit's purpose is to guide us in day-to-day -day decisions, helping us discern calling. Remember, uh, Philip and the eunuch on, uh, in, in, um, <clears throat> in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian eunuch, and uh, Philip is walking along, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot, and he goes and unpacks the Bible to this eunuch, which apparently birthed the entire Ethiopian church, so the spirit there to stir and to speak, and then fourthly, the sustaining of all creation at all times, this also includes um, the spirit that's being present more broadly in truth and love, that all divine activity in the world is in fact the activity of God's spirit. So it is 1058. Um, I hope I haven't given you too much of a prescription of how you need to think about the Holy Spirit, but given you some new categories and language for the ways in which you do already experience the Holy Spirit and already have experienced the Holy Spirit. And um, does, I don't know if this means, uh, if the, the takeaway here is not that people who aren't charismatic need to become charismatic. It's more that um, to understand the lure of Pentecostalism and the, is to understand the emphasis on God's, uh, the living reality of God in the world and in our lives today. That's why they're talking about the Holy Spirit so much. They're trying to get it out of the realm of history and into where you're actually living right now. So, and that many understandings of the Holy Spirit that sort of hide the Holy Spirit conveniently behind some doctrine or feature of the Christian life, whether that be the sacraments or the Bible or the church, um, seem to be missing something of the core element of what's um, at work here, that the living and completely free character of the spirit and of God is something we uh, learn to remember and to take seriously by the work of the Holy Spirit. Whew. It is 11 o'clock and um, I will stay on, uh, but I want to recognize that uh, if for another 10 minutes or so and take questions, but it, people need to go, I thought I'd say a prayer before we end. Let us pray. The Holy Spirit, please be with us today. Be with us in, in our lives uh, as, and as we cannot meet together in person. Um, renew us, uh, stir us, guide us, apply uh, the, the good news to our hearts. Um, and sustain us as we go about um, life in the world. Give us uh, all things for the sake of your son and for the love that he has shown us uh, and the world. In whose name we pray, amen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone. I see a chat, I'll look at this. Oh, that was <coughs> Charlie. Can you make a comment uh, upon the verse that talks about the unforgivable sin of quenching the Holy Spirit? <laughs> no, no, I cannot make a comment on that. Um, that is, uh, again, another, how do you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? That's, um, that's in the Bible. And what does that mean? And how, if the Holy Spirit is a power and discernment, where does, where does that leave you? I don't know. 
I'm not willing to be the person who interprets that definitively once and for all. I don't blame you. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> you know, Dave, it's Mike Dickens. Mm. Can you hey, hear Mike. me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. I went to medical school at Columbia University in New York, which is probably one of the top five medical schools in the world and a, a real temple of science and engraved in the stone over the main entrance that every student has to walk under every day is a saying that says, of the most high cometh healing. And I think it, to me, it was always a reminder that, you know, you're there to learn the science, but there's something else going on as well. Mm. And um, so I just thought I'd throw, throw that in. That's great. Of the most high cometh healing. Of the most high cometh healing. This, uh, that's, that's beautiful, Mike. I mean, I think that, that that's what we're talking about here. That's, I didn't know that that was at Columbia Medical School. That's where my, mm -hmm. my best friend from college also went. Hey, Dave, someone asked in the um, chat, for those of us who bought the book, what chapters or pages should we focus on? For those who bought my brother Simeon's book, uh, the, yes, the, you can skip chapters one, two, and three. Uh, chapters four and five are the main thrust of the argument as well as the introduction. Um, uh, that's where I would go. And we can talk more about that and, uh, on, in person, but those are the. Dave, do we have a copy of that book in our church library? Cause I know it might kind of be cost prohibitive to some people. Is there a copy that could be loaned out? Um, we don't, but we can get one. Okay. I'll, get, I'll, I'll order one tomorrow. Dave, how do you search on uh, YouTube for your presentations? You search for Christ Church Charlottesville, and then our page will come up, and that will have all of, uh, if you click on, once it goes to the, our, the profile for Christ Church Charlottesville, you can, or, or Trinity Upperville, to be honest with you, you can, uh, you click videos, and you'll see the videos for Paul's daily, his, his um, almost daily devotional and then interspersed with that are Sunday services and the video, these videos. There's, as well. there's also a, a playlist tab that has them divided up. So it's got the Sunday school, the adult ed, the services and uh, Paul's devotionals. So that's an easy way to find them. If you don't mind a little commercial from me. Oh, yes. Uh, in my book, A Sacred Walk, Dispelling the Fear of Death and Caring for the Dying, there's a chapter called God with Skin On in which I help to differentiate between the fruit of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit and how they are used. So I hope that anybody who has the book, and I know some of the people in our church do, they can review that. And it's very um, consistent with what you've been preaching. A Sacred Walk by Donna Authors. Donna will also be one of the panel speakers next Saturday for the Greece, uh, Gra Grace and Grief discussion we're doing next Saturday morning. If you guys haven't heard about that, the information's on our website. Thank you, Jen, and please pray for me <laughs> and the other presenters. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I just wanna say thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity. I, this uh, gave me an opportunity not only to dive into my brother's work more deeply, but for my own understanding of my life and faith and it's been tremendously edifying and i hope that we can continue this conversation in person as well as over email and uh again we're the uh, our adult ed continues next week we're doing an advent series in which we because the paint looking at paintings and uh music has been so uh seemed to be so has been so well received we're going to continue that and uh paul and mary lou and josh are going to each take one class and talk about the themes of Advent in poetry and painting. And I do commend that to you. I'll be present on that too, if, 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 if we want to continue talking about this in some way too. So um, I just want to thank you for this one. It's been wonderful. Oh, thank you, Margie. Um, thank you, David. It really has been great. Thank you, everyone. I'm so glad Thank we you. got to do this. And we'll, we'll convene here again uh, next week, but also in the new year, we're working on some uh, exciting adult ed offerings as well. Okay, bless you all and have a wonderful Sunday. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.